All right, turn your Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 16. I know it's been five weeks since we were here in Matthew 16, but we're going to pick up where, kind of where we left off. I'm going to do a verse-by-verse teaching. It's actually starting in 13, which we covered last time, some of these verses, but we're going to do a little bit of a recap, though not covering everything we talked about. But uh, Matthew 16 is about the, the voices. I'm, in fact, I'm kind of titling this, this sermon today, Voices. Uh, the different voices that show up there in this chapter. Uh, so it's about the voices the disciples of Jesus heard and what was being said. Jesus wanted his followers to be aware of the contrast between false voices and his voice and the voice of the Heavenly Father. Then Peter hears for the first time the voice of the Father in heaven, in heaven speaking truth into his heart and mind. Now, a careful study of Matthew 16 will reveal an integrated cohesiveness of Jesus equipping his disciples to beware of false antichrist voices such as the Sadducees and the Pharisees that Jesus continued to contend with and to discover that they can hear the voice of the Father speaking by means of the Holy Spirit within them. And that's a, an application for each of us as well. That when Jesus went away, he said, I'm not going to leave you alone. There's going to come the Holy Spirit. He's going to be with you and dwell in you. And that's where we hear from God now, through the Holy Spirit. And so that's a kind of a neglected subject in the church today. Vicki and I have been uh, listening to, an, uh, uh, at least beginning to listen to, an audio book uh, by Francis Chang. Is that right, Vicki? Chan, Francis Chan, and uh, he talks about this very issue in the church today, how we have to, as a church, understand that God wants to speak today into our hearts through His Spirit and be with us and guide us by His Spirit. Now, the first voice Jesus was concerned about was the multitudes around the disciples. And we're going to start here at verse 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, He asked His disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And by way of reminder from five weeks ago, Caesarea Philippi was a center for pagan worship. It was considered in the Old Testament times as the home of the Canaanite god uh, Baal Gad, god of good fortune. And during the Greek period, it was dedicated as a place of worship uh, to the Greek god Pan. There are niches in the caves there that held carvings and statues of the nymphs. And you can still see evidence of these today. Actually, uh, we took a group of people over to Israel one year, and, and we have a photograph of Janice Marek's son uh, getting up on one of the pedestals uh, that one of these statues was placed on and posing there, you know. And so that was kind of an interesting thing to, to visit that place because it's the backdrop for Jesus saying, you know, you've got all these false gods here that before you, but who are people saying that I am? And so we hear this voice from the multitudes as he asked that question. So they said to him, so some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Then Jesus gives his disciples, you see, here a test themselves. Who do you think I am? Who do you say that I am? What are your voices saying about me in this world? And so Simon Peter gives the famous confession of faith that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. In verse 17, we see the important truth that we, no one can convince another person to believe in who Jesus is. That it takes a revelation, not by flesh and blood, but a revelation of the Holy Spirit from the Heavenly Father to convince a person that Jesus is the Christ, that He is Lord, that He is the Son of God. And so we can't convince anybody. It's the Holy Spirit maybe speaking through us that convinces people. So we're not on our own when we're talking to people about the Lord. Because the Holy Spirit is speaking to them as well. And then in verse 17, Jesus, we see an important truth here that Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Faith comes when a person 
is hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit in his or her heart above all other voices, whether it's the multitude, whether it's the Sadducees and the Pharisees or whoever it might be uh, who's speaking into our lives, that the, the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking above all of those. But one of the challenges we face in this world is that all of these other voices have a tendency to drown out the voice of God. To drown out what is the Holy Spirit is trying to speak into people's lives. So at the beginning of this, the Sadducees and the Pharisees asked Jesus to validate his identity uh, with some sign from heaven. And he told them that the only sign would be a revelation from the kingdom of heaven. A proclamation that came directly from the kingdom of heaven. The preaching of the gospel. The preaching of Jesus and who he is. That it would have to come from heaven. It would be a spiritual revelation that would take place. And he warned the disciples about the leaven of these two sects of the Jews. One that spoke from an obsession with the rabbinical law. And the other that was obsessed with political control. And so uh, you know, we have these two voices that, that were trying to speak the disciples. We're hearing all these voices and they're wondering, okay, who's really speaking the truth here? And maybe, you know, are these guys right about something or should we, should we contend with what they're saying? So those voices were speaking, very powerful voices in the, in the nation of Israel, these religious uh, leaders that were there. And he was telling his followers to not allow those voices to drown out the truth of the kingdom of heaven. Now let's take heed as well. The current culture around us has many voices. Let us not allow the voice of God's kingdom to be drowned out in our hearts by the voices that are speaking so loudly around us. Have you ever heard such loud speaking as what we've had in the two political conventions? <laughs> I mean, who knows who's telling the truth about anything? You know, it's just a lot of rhetoric going on. And then so people break into applause when somebody some, says something very strongly, intensely about something. But, but, you know, those voices all around us are constantly speaking at us. And they can drown out what God's trying to say if we're not careful. So the knowledge that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah, uh, comes by way of a voice of truth from heaven and is revealed to a listening heart. Then the confession of faith is made that Jesus Christ is Lord. Just as Peter made that confession, it has now become it is Peter's confession of faith. You might say he was the first to make that confession. And it has been the confession of true believers ever since then. It's the confession of the church. Uh, listen to what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 12.3. He, he said, no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. In Romans 10, 9, he said, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Philippians 2, 9, that very famous, you know, quotation there about Jesus being Lord, the name that God has given him. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus declares that he will build his church on that confession of faith. He is the cornerstone of faith himself, but it's that confession that opens the door to many other things regarding faith. So he said, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now, several weeks ago, we talked pretty extensively on this particular verse, so we're not going to go back and redo that. I encourage you to pick up a CD or, or to go online and listen to that sermon uh, a few weeks ago, and, and uh, so you'll get kind of the, you know, the nuts and bolts of what we were talking about there. But I do want to speak some today about what Jesus meant when he said that he would build his church. Now, under the Old Covenant, the word church referred to the congregation of Israel. Jesus replaced the Old Covenant with the New Covenant, sealed by his death, sealed by his own blood, for the atonement of sin. In the New Covenant, Jesus was raised from the dead, and he conquered death, and he conquered Hades, 
which would no longer hold the souls of those that believed in Him. And so He's building His church. The church Jesus speaks about here is not some institution. It is not an organization. It is not an association. You know, we're part of the Calvary Chapel Association, you know. But that's just a kind of a tag, okay? It's where we get our mail, so to speak. That's not, the Calvary Chapel Association is not the church. You know, it's an association is what it is, of like-minded churches. And so, in order to, it, it's not a, a denomination, and neither is it a cluster of facilities with a sign out front. Uh, we have to get away from a perception of the church being these kinds of things in order to understand what it means that Jesus is building His church. His congregation includes all who have believed in their hearts and confessed with their mouths that Jesus is Christ, that Jesus is Lord, and the Son of the living God, to the glory of God the Father. That's His church. Later, the apostles described the church with some of these terms, the God's people, uh, the temple of the Holy Spirit, a spiritual fellowship, a household of faith, the family of God, the body of Christ, with Christ as the head of the body. Peter described the church as a peculiar people and a royal priesthood. He wrote that the church is a building from God, and we are living stones built upon Jesus Christ, who is the chief cornerstone. So there's a living thing. The church is something that's alive. It's an organism. It's not an organization. You know, uh, it doesn't have the true or the real church doesn't have to file a 501c3. It doesn't have to, you know, sign up with the IRS and none of those things. You know, that's all part of the structure of the institutional church world. And we take advantage, of course, not having to pay taxes because of that. And so we kind of go along with some things about the institutional church, don't we? Uh, and uh, then we have buildings that we meet in because there's really not many other places we can meet. Back in the early church, they had a lot of big homes they met in, but now we have to meet in facilities like this. But, but uh, you know, the church of Christ has been, that Christ has been building has been given eternal life, and Hades cannot hold those souls, those people, uh, nor can any antichrist spiritual beings prevail against them in spiritual warfare. Now, in verse 19, he continues. He says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, the imagery of keys is used here, as well as that of binding and loosing. The idea here is that true followers of Christ, through the confession of Jesus as, the, as Lord, as the Christ, will be enabled to discover the will of God on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, we will have access to some understanding of that, what that means. And so uh, we'll be enabled to discover that. And they will have heavenly access to the information that is in the mind of God about life, about relationships, about everything that we go through in this world. God has a plan. He has an, an, an operational thing that he does, and he wants to pass that on to our own hearts. Now, uh, the idea here uh, is that uh, the working definition of the kingdom of heaven is this. And we've talked about this a few times along the way. Who he is, what he has declared, and what he wills. That's a really great definition of what it means when we say the kingdom of heaven. The mysteries of the kingdom of heaven will be unlocked. Uh, that's the imagery of the keys, keys to the kingdom of heaven. The mysteries of the kingdom of heaven will be unlocked, just like with the revelation which Peter received, that, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, so we see that the first key that unlocks the kingdom of heaven is the revelation of the Holy Spirit of who Jesus is, who He is, uh, and that He is Christ, the Son of God. Second, what God has declared becomes meaningful to us. The Spirit of Christ opens our understanding to the mystery of godliness. It opens our understanding of how the kingdom of heaven operates. And when we read and study scripture, it comes to life for us. I think it was Martin Luther who said that the scripture is alive. And the Bible is alive. It runs after me, he said. It takes hold of me. It's a living thing. And so... 
Uh, neither is it's not just a piece of literature. It's an important piece of literature in our world because much of the English literature that has been written over the many centuries has a, much of the Bible incorporated into it. Uh, and so uh, we understand that it is literature. But more than that, it is the, the revelation of God. Uh, somebody says his love letters to mankind. You know, that he wants us to, to open these up to, to unlock the scripture for us. To help us understand what it's saying to us. And so, and, and then there thirdly is a key of the kingdom of heaven that unlocks the understanding of what is the will of God on earth as it is in heaven. Some of this we know through the scripture, but I think it's more than that. The concept of binding and loosing is a legal concept, meaning that what is allowed or permitted and what is not allowed or permitted. To bind means to not allow, and to loose means to allow something. So God allows and disallows certain things from heaven, his understanding of things, and he wants to pass on that to us. And that's what binding and loosing is about. So this is Jesus' way of saying that we are not left to our own thinking, but will be led by the Holy Spirit. We will be able to know when to go and when to stop, when to say yes and when to say no, when to speak and when to remain silent. Uh, how did Jesus know when and how to choose his course of action in this world? And his associations, what he spoke about, what he said to people, how he handled everything that he encountered in this world. How did he know what to do? Well, we understand that he heard the voice of his father speaking these things to him. As he would go off and retreat from the disciples and he would commune with God the Father, the Father would be with him and commune with him what he was to do next. And what he was not to do. He understood those things. And so uh, there is also a spiritual, I think, a spiritual intuition that motivates into action or constrains us from taking some kind of action. Uh, in his name, we too, you see, have access to the Holy Spirit within us in, in order to receive the wisdom that comes from heaven. It's a greater wisdom than our wisdom. Uh, James talked about how there is a, an earthly wisdom. He even says there's a demonic wisdom. And then he said that there is a spiritual wisdom that comes from God. We need to understand that spiritual wisdom. And, and James even declared that anyone who asks for that kind of wisdom with, a, with an open heart, without doubting, will receive it. You know, you'll be able to hear from God what his, what his thoughts on things are for your life and your relationships and whatever your decisions are that are rising on the horizon uh, that you're about to need to make. So there is a spiritual intuition uh, that can lead us and help us understand what God allows or disallows in, in terms of his point of view. A case in point was with the Apostle Paul who wanted to go to Asia but was forbidden to go, he said, by the Spirit. This is in Acts chapter 16, beginning at verse 5. It says, So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden, listen, forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. And after they had come to Messia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them or allow them. The Spirit did not loose them to go into Asia. But they, it was bound, okay? And so passing, uh, and they, let me pick up here again. After they came to Messiah, they tried to go in Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Messiah, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord has called us to preach the gospel to them. Now, not many of us perhaps have a vision like Paul had about Macedonia. But I do believe that when God says no to something, that he's got another plan. You know, and God's plan here was not that they go uh, there into Asia, but they go to Macedonia instead. And so we get all uptight, don't we, when... Down in our hearts, God, we believe that God is saying no to us about something. And especially if we've been obsessing about it, you know, planning it, 
you know, pushing for it for a long time and all of a sudden we realize that God's not on the same page with us about it. We get frustrated with God, don't we? Well, listen, I want to tell you, when God does that, it's because He has a better plan for you. And we don't want to miss it, do we? And we don't want to miss it at all. And so, uh, I've often wondered, though, how it was that they knew the Holy Spirit was sending them out, other than that vision, for instance, how did they know God was forbidding them to go uh, to and constraining them? Uh, so listen again to what Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. I use this verse to give advice to people about a decision they're about to make as they're confused or they're wondering what should I do or not do here? What should I bind or loose in this situation? Uh, it's, it's, he says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you were called in one body. Now Paul tells us about the peace of God being in our hearts. Now this can be for uh, a corporate setting. Uh, he talks about being one body. There can be an application here for a, a body of people making a decision about something. But it also is true about an individual as well. The word heart in Scripture refers to that inner part of us where we experience spiritual intuition. Where we are motivated. In Scripture, it also refers to the indescribable place where we commune with the Heavenly Father, with God. That place where His Spirit dwells within us and we understand spiritual truth as well as we can discern evil spirits, we can discern heresy, we can discern things that are not of the Lord, uh, and, and that which is not from God. It is where we experience the peace of God. And that's the application here. Do I have peace about this situation or do I have a, an absence of peace about it? So what then is the peace of God? It is the inner awareness that we are in harmony with the will of God. And it is an intuitive awareness that we are on the same page with God about issues in our lives, about decisions, and about relationships. So it stands to reason that the absence of peace would mean what? When we don't have that peace, that harmony, that sense of harmony with God, what would that tell us? It would tell us perhaps that God is saying, no, that's not allowed. You know, that's something that needs to be bound. You know, and not loosed in your life. Does that make sense? Okay, so the absence of peace. Now the word rule here is used like we think of as an umpire or an arbitrator. The point is that the peace of God acts like a referee in our hearts. Uh, and when we're headed in the wrong direction, when we're thinking of going someplace that God doesn't want us to go, do something that God doesn't want us to do, then He kind of blows the whistle and our peace is interrupted. Okay, And so when we are making a choice that is in the will of God, there will be a quiet sense of harmony within our hearts, a sense of spiritual and emotional rest. When we are moving away from the will of God, there will be an internal restlessness and a discontent that God is allowing us to experience in order to help us tap the brakes and say, you know what, this just might, might not be the way to go, you know. Now, I'm kind of uh, a self-sufficient guy and uh, a strong-willed person. My mom, even to this day, says, Jerry, you were always a strong-willed child, you know. And how, that, how does that play out in my relationship with God? Well, you can probably figure that one out. That I have to kind of do it, try to do it on my own first. Even if I've got that intuitive sense that God doesn't allow something, sometimes I'm going to say, well, I'm going to give it a try anyways. I don't want to tell you there's not a single time that I've had that restlessness and that discontent, that lack of peace in my heart, and I've gone ahead and done it my way that I didn't regret it, and I didn't suffer the consequences of that wrong decision. So think about that. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. So the peace of God will help us discern what is bound or loosed on earth as it is in the mind of God in heaven. Perhaps some of us here today are weighing some things in our hearts and minds. Some decision in our hearts. Well, what is the peace of God telling us? Is there an absence of peace? Is there an intuitive sense that God is saying, <laughs> I don't think that's good for you? <laughs> you know, I see things that you don't see. I see an obstacle ahead of you. I see a, you know, something that's, that's not going to be great in your life happening. You know, or does, is there a sense of peace that says, yeah, I'll go for it. You know, I'm, I'm on that page with you. And I'm going to give you wisdom to find 
where you need to go, where you need to be with that. So that decision that God, that you've got to make, wait on the Lord, wait, listen to Him. See what He has to say first before signing on the dotted line, so to speak, you know. Uh, and what is the peace of God telling us? Now, keeping all that in mind, let's see what happened next between Jesus and Peter in verse 20. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. You see, it just wasn't the right time. Uh, if, if they began to rally around him as being the Christ to everybody around them, then it would have escalated the, the persecution of the, scri the scribes and Pharisees and the Sadducees and of Herod and whoever else was working against him. And it would have shortened his opportunity to disciple and equip his disciples the way they needed and so it wasn't the right time. So he tells them, wait. Why? Because that's what he had peace in his heart about. You know, he wasn't going to go ahead and do something, encourage them to do something that wasn't going to be beneficial to God's plan. So from this time on, most of Jesus' ministry was not to the multitudes, but to his disciples. For the first time, Jesus tells them here about the coming time of suffering and his death and his resurrection. So let's read there in verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. He just gave Peter some keys, right? Keys to the kingdom of heaven. He's already lost them. You know, in our house, we've got a key finder thing, you know. One member of our household needs that. <laughs> we were, whoa, the other day, you know, the battery had gone dead in it. <laughs> so we had to do it the old-fashioned way, you know. But Peter had lost his keys. He is binding and loosing now what has not been bound or loosed in heaven. He's doing it himself. So he follows the dictates of his own mind rather than wisdom from heaven. And he's listening to what voice? Two voices, really. He's listening to his own voice, to his own mind, rather than the voice of Jesus. Jesus says it's a matter of being mindful of the things of God. But Peter's own thoughts interrupted his ability to listen. That ever happened to you? Yeah, you know, that happens with me and people sometimes. You know, somebody will start talking to me about something and, and my mind will start racing ahead of them, assuming what they're about to say. You ever do that? You probably don't do that. I think guys do that more than gals do. You know, but, uh, but all of a sudden I'm interrupting that person and I'm saying, yeah, I know all about that. Yeah, but, you know, let me tell you, you know. And they stop me and they go, you know, I wasn't finished yet. <laughs> I really wasn't going to say what you thought I was going to say. Uh, so I've had to exercise more discipline to listen to people. Uh, so Peter was having trouble listening. And as we know about the life of Peter with, with Jesus and his uh, discipleship with Jesus, we know that he did this quite often. <laughs> uh, we can quickly get into trouble when we follow the course of our own thinking. Listen. Listen. We have been given the keys to unlocking understanding of the mind of Christ. This is repeated over and over in the epistles that the apostles gave the churches. But sometimes our fleshly thinking and experience is in conflict with God's will. Now we need not be too hard on Peter here. Uh, for one thing, too many of us are a lot like him. But also, we see this thing where Peter felt very close to Jesus. He had an affection for him. He had a friendship with Jesus. And he sort of saw, we know from other events between Jesus and Peter, that he felt like he was kind of Jesus' bodyguard. You know, He was a security detail for Jesus. He was the one who wasn't going to let anybody get close to him. 
you know. We had one Sunday here where there was a fellow here at church and, and he was angry with about something I said in my sermon. And he blurted out real something real loudly and he's a great big guy and so he was still angry when the service ended and he came up to straighten me out. And uh, really it was a misunderstanding more than anything. But all of a sudden I noticed two guys, one on my left and one on my right. And I said, what are you guys doing here? And I said, well, we saw what was going on and we're here to protect you, you know. <laughs> well, that's the way Peter saw himself. He was there to protect Jesus as his bodyguard. He wanted to save Jesus from trouble, from suffering. He wanted to save him from the contentiousness of those who were against him. You know, and, and that's, that's, that's okay. I mean, that's, that's sort of what we're wired to do, in a sense, with friends, isn't it? So, in his own mind, though, Peter thought what Jesus was saying wasn't right. It was out in left field somewhere. Now, this is the Lord. This is the guy he just referred to as the Lord, the Son of the living God, you know. He said, well, I, you know, I know you're, you're the Lord, Son of the living God, but I'm telling you what you're saying right now is just not right. <laughs> it says actually that he rebuked Jesus. Anybody ever done that here? He rebuked him. <laughs> well, how can one minute Peter declare Jesus to be the Christ, the Son of God, and then minutes later contend with him and even rebuke Jesus for what he said? Well, Peter spoke too quickly. This was a time for him to step back and listen to Jesus. And in the next chapter, in chapter 17, he does it again. He's having this tremendous, unbelievable, supernatural experience of being on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. And after, you know, Moses and Elijah, they kind of disappeared, you know, and the glory of the Lord still hanging around. And, and all of a sudden, Peter interrupted everything. And you know what God spoke and said? Be quiet. Listen to my son. <laughs> Listen to Jesus. And that's what Peter needed to do here too. So, he spoke too quickly. He had to learn to wait for direction and to trust in the words of Jesus. And how often do we blurt something out and decide we're going to do something so impulsively and, and we don't have adequate information uh, and then we later on are saying, you know, I wish I hadn't said that and hadn't, wish I hadn't done that. <laughs> you know, I spoke too quickly. I wish I had listened more instead of speaking more. Here he is also hearing the deceitful voice of Satan as well. He doesn't recognize it. He doesn't know that's what it is. But in a sense, he is listening to Satan in a very subtle, deceitful way trying to keep Jesus from following through on his mission to die on the cross for the atonement of our sins. So he wound up saying something that Satan likely had already been telling Jesus in an effort to keep Jesus from going to the cross. Without realizing, Peter had become a mouthpiece for Satan. So not only was Peter listening to his own voice above the voice of the Lord, but he's even listening to the voice of Satan above the Lord as well. The subtle influence of Satan for all of us is that whatever we think is best, uh, even if it goes counter to the will of God, you know, the Satan will use that in our lives to steer our course a, a different direction than what God has planned for us. But listen, because of our confession of faith in Jesus as Lord, he has given to us the keys to the kingdom of heaven, the keys to understand who He is, what He has declared, and what He wills. But like Peter, we sometimes speak too soon. We don't listen. In the next several verses, Jesus explains what it takes to make the exchange of our ways and thinking for the mind and the will of God. He spells it out here, beginning at verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will gain it. What profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? Now these verses, guys, are about the transformation of a person's innermost being. 
from the old way of living to a new way of living. It's a transformation of a person's soul. And what brings it on, as Jesus explains, or what keeps it from happening, he talks about as well. The words life and soul here are interchangeable. They mean a person's heart, a person's mind, a person's will, a person's personality. And without transformation, the soul is very flawed. It is wounded oftentimes. It is, uh, it's even been abused and it's, been, it's falling into disarray. It's fragmented, confused. The heart is full of ways detrimental to life and relationships. For some reason, human nature wants to hold on to these old ways as if it were a treasure. Why is that? If we hold on to things like anger and unforgiveness and bitterness and all those ugly things as if they're jewels of some kind, you know, we polish them up as if they're real special and all they are is like cancer in our lives, drawing life away from us. So without transformation, the soul continues to deepen the flaws Life and relationships follow a repetitive and declining path, but God wants to heal and transform our souls. Let me use my own injured shoulder as, an, as a little parable for you today. Uh, now, several months ago, I suffered a massive tear to my right shoulder. At first, I was in denial about it. I thought, you know, given time and being careful how I use my arm and all that, you know, that it, it'll all iron out. It'll be fine, you know. I've gone through something like this before, and, and so I'm thinking it's no really big deal. So I did nothing. But the pain and the weakness in my arm and my shoulder became worse. And finally, I went to the doctor, and I had an extremely painful MRI. I've never in my life gone through that kind of pain before for 30 minutes. I mean, I was quoting the 23rd Psalm during it, you know. In the follow-up appointment, before the surgeon could tell me what was needed for my healing after he saw the MRI, I once again suggested to this very astute, highly respectable, rep reputable man, surgeon, that I thought that I would rather just get more rest instead of having surgery. I didn't know what the MRI showed at all. He said, Mr. McAnulty, I have to tell you that that tendon will not reattach itself. You're going to have to have surgery. And then he said, what do you want to do? I said, I guess I'll have surgery. It was the only answer. But the point is that I could have already been well on the way to healing perhaps be somewhat healed by now if I had sought help a lot sooner. Vicki had kept insisting that I go to the doctor, but I had stubbornly delayed. So it is with the voice of the Holy Spirit within us, who keeps on speaking about the weakness in our souls. The Lord waits for our surrender to His soul surgery and rehabilitation. But it involves surrender, doesn't it? Jesus tells us here that a person must let go of the old life in order to experience the new life. To embrace the will of God as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. It's a necessary choice for transformation of one's soul. The question arises about Jesus speaking of taking up one's cross here. He would have been very familiar with crucifixion as when he was about 11 years of age. There was a a Galilean by the name of Judas, not the same one that followed Jesus, but had a rebellion against Rome in a community just about four miles from where Jesus was raised. The Romans put down the uprising by burning down the town and telling, selling the inhabitants into slavery, and 2,000 of the rebels were crucified along each side of the road, not far from where Jesus lived. It was the Roman practice to have the convicted to carry their own cross beam to their own crucifixion. Luke's account quotes Jesus as saying that one who follows him must take up a daily cross. And he points out that this would be a daily decision that would need to be made. 
Each day, a follower of Christ is at the crossroads of some decision to either obey the fleshly, self-centered nature or to choose to live according to God's will. So when we come to needing to make choices, the question is this. What would my Lord Jesus Christ, King of my life, have me to do in this situation? Not what I want to do, but what would the Lord have me do? Jesus himself practiced that when he was in the garden. You remember what he said? You know, I would that this cup would pass from me, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And that is that kind of surrender we're talking about. Paul wrote about the knowledge of Christ taking every thought into captivity. Our thoughts so often are so far off base, they're not on target. You know, they're based somewhere in the flesh rather than in the kingdom of heaven. In today's text, we hear about what voices we may choose to listen to. The exchange that took place between Jesus and Peter is like a parable for each of us. Peter opened his mind to the mind of Christ and declared the most important truth that Jesus is the Son of God. Then he flipped back to evaluating things from his own mind as he reproved the Lord for prophesying his arrest and crucifixion. But over time, Peter's soul experienced transformation. If you read the book of Acts and the life of Peter, the, in the ministry of Peter, you see that God was always challenging his fleshly ways, his prejudices. And he, he was constantly bringing Peter to that point of decision. Now, are you going to listen to yourself or are you going to listen to me? You know. And thankfully, Peter experienced what it means to listen to the Lord. Uh, when Peter surrendered, exchanging his own ways for the Lord's will, he was transformed. And he gave up his old life for the new life that the Lord had given him. The question is, today, what voices are we listening to? Are there voices in our lives that are drowning out the voice of God? The voice that wants to lead us into new life? Wants to lead our souls into healing and transformation? Or are we listening to the voice of the multitude? Are we listening to the voice of organized religion? Listen to the voice of politics? Are we listening to the voice of our own mind? What about other people that we're hanging out with? You know, voices, always voices around us. When God wants to speak something into our hearts that will change our lives in a powerful way. The question for all of us is whether or not we are able to choose the Lord's will over our own. It's really a question of surrender, isn't it? It's our being able to say, I give up, Lord. I give up my own jurisdiction over me to let you be my Lord. Darren's going to come and we're going to sing that song, I Surrender All. What I'd like for you to consider this morning, are there things in your soul that have kind of cluttered up the works? You know, over the next couple of chapters, Peter's still on the scene going through stuff. And again and again, Jesus challenges him to give up his old ways and, and embrace the new. And it's going to be an interesting thing to follow that with Peter. But we're in the same boat, aren't we? You know, we're in the same boat. And we need to evaluate how much of our life as a Christian are we living according to me instead of according to Jesus? You know, are we willing to surrender anger, resentment, unforgiveness? Those are some of the things that Jesus dealt with Peter about. It's ongoing. Are we willing to consider those issues as not being good for us? And recognize no matter what anybody's done to us over time, that it's time to let go and let God. And to surrender that for newness of life and let Him fill our souls with His thinking and His ways. Stand with me if you would. And as we sing this, maybe you could identify something that you need to surrender to the Lord today. And go ahead and say that to him. Lord, I've decided I'm not going to keep this. I'm not going to keep polishing that old junk in my life as if it's a treasure. 
I'm going to give it up to you. And I'm going to let you replace it with something of great value that truly is a treasure. I surrender all, Lord. And Lord, as we begin this song, I pray that you would stir in every heart an awareness of what we need to surrender from our own self ways, the surrender to letting other voices uh, speak louder than yours into our hearts. Lord, reveal to us what needs to go. Reveal to us how to go, how to stop, when to speak and when to be silent. Cleanse our hearts, Lord, as we surrender to you in Jesus' name. Amen.